Does anybody here like airplanes? Welcome to another episode of Burn Your Draft, the podcast exploring the Reed Senior thesis process and experience. I'm your host and producer, Avis Correa, and today Arun will explain his thesis that explores the challenges that airlines face during the shift to sustainability. Cool. Yeah. So my name is Arun Barua Das. I am from two places. I was born in the Bay Area, California. I grew up for the most part in Mumbai, India for 13 years. I graduated with a degree in economics. My thesis was on airline profitability and fleet strategies in a carbon tax environment, which basically just means how do airlines adapt to carbon taxes. And my thesis advisor was Aaron Hunt. Can you tell us a little bit more about the context of your thesis? Yeah, sure. So I have always had a huge passion for the world of aviation. I've traveled all my life. The first time I flew, I don't remember it, but I was six months old. I went to my uncle's wedding in India. So as a little baby, I traveled halfway across the world. Having moved abroad when I was very young, that also meant a lot of travel. From a young age, that was a big part of my life, and it started to form a passion. I remember when I got my first flight simulator, I, I was like a little kid, and I was putting hundreds of hours flying around, and eventually it transformed into a real interest on an academic sense. Last summer, I had the opportunity to intern with a company called Pratt & Whitney. They're the second largest jet engine manufacturer in the world. I worked in operational commercial engines as a program manager, which is their wide body engines, the big engines on the big planes that go across oceans, essentially. So we're talking eight plus hour flights. Uh, it was a really, really cool experience. Made me realize this is something that I could see myself doing for the rest of my life also a big reason why I chose to write my thesis on what I did. I've always had an interest in sustainability as well. I think everyone in our generation does. I also had a formal internship experience working at a venture capital firm, studying and researching, building an investment thesis on climate tech. So I'd already started to develop an understanding of where the world broadly is going, but also where energy needs are going, how we're starting to see more emphasis on green hydrogen becoming a new feedstock 10 or 20 years in the future. I wanted to combine those two passions and interests together. Aviation is actually considered to be the hardest or one of the hardest to decarbonize sectors of the global economy. There's two things to think about. Decarbonizing, long story short, means how do we minimize or completely eliminate carbon emissions from a specific sector. This is a goal that as we're getting closer to 2050, every sector globally is really thinking about this seriously. Many companies have publicly committed to net zero, which means that they're held to it by, for instance, the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, which oversees publicly traded companies. And then feedstock is a whole other question altogether, but it's still very important. So essentially, almost everything on this planet is a limited resource, right? We have very few quote unquote unlimited resources. But when it comes to, for instance, with fuel, there is a limited feedstock on the planet. In the aviation industry, we've been trying to create sustainable aviation fuel. So rather than pumping hydrocarbons out of the planet out of the ground and using that as gas for airplanes, we're looking at creating a synthetic fuel that also has those hydrocarbons, but is produced in a more sustainable way. So right now, we're mostly looking at using things like spent cooking oil or corn or algae, those kinds of things. And those are feedstock limited, which means that the input material, there's only a limited supply. Feedstock is currently very, very limited of a lot of those current SAFs because we use it for many other things. I wanted to explore, you know, what can we do? Even though it's difficult, there is still something that we must do, right? And one of the most obvious steps is to legitimately just procure and operate newer airplanes that have newer engine technology in particular. In the aviation sector, step changes in efficiency are to the tune of 15 to 20 percent. So we're not talking radical change. When you go from a gas car to an EV, you're probably looking at a substantially larger carbon reduction. But again, because of those constraints, it's so difficult to come up with radical innovation in the sector. For the most part, we're, we're limited to these generational leaps of only about 20%. Nonetheless, 20% on a global scale is still a lot of carbon save. So I still wanted to explore what that meant for airlines as they are currently transitioning from last generation aircraft to current modern aircraft. looking back on my thesis research, my topic is looking more at ground reality right now. So everything I've just spoken about is almost like a fantasy for the industry. SAF currently contributes about 0.5% of the total 
gas used for aviation. We're trying to rapidly expand it, but it's feedstock constraint in particular, which makes it very difficult to do that. The cost is very high. It's three to four times the cost of regular Chet A, which is the conventional aviation fuel that they use. Most airlines are not buying it and using it. On the other hand, it's possible for airlines to buy newer airplanes today, right? They can actually buy newer airplanes and get a 15 to 20% reduction in their fuel burn. So I wanted to explore how the industry would adapt with what they have right now. It also would make it potentially slightly easier for me to empirically assess because there is available data. It's an understood problem versus, say, SAF adoption, which is still very much unknown. That's what makes it interesting, but also potentially a multi-year project rather than a single-year project. And I also wanted to explore how there's two parts to my thesis, right? There's the part of the fleet strategy, but there's also how the fleet strategy changes with the carbon tax. A carbon tax, you know, for some simple economics understanding, trying to achieve what's called a Pigouvian tax. So we're trying to internalize externalities. An externality of flight is carbon emissions. And an externality is essentially when something happens as a result of this specific process or whatever product you're talking about that is not accounted for in the cost. So to internalize the externality of carbon emissions is to say, okay, if you are emitting these many tons of carbon dioxide per flight, let's tax you at a rate to match that. The idea is that that tax is then usually, and depending on the industry, is passed through to the consumer. And in doing so, the consumer's price is higher. So that would mean your ticket price goes up. And if your ticket price goes up, then the subsequent idea is that it's supposed to disincentivize flight or just anything. So we see this with sin tax as well. So I wanted to see how the impact on like the financial profit margin of airlines would differ based on what kind of airplane they operate. I assessed designs. The earliest one was from entry into service in 1989, uh, the Airbus A320, current engine option CEO. And then the next generation, which had upgraded engines and some other upgrades. So we're talking, you know, like a 25 to 30 year interval between those two generations. And again, think about that. So 30 years, right? Like 30 years, a lot has changed. Even in the time we've been alive, a lot has changed. But in the airplane world, they've only been able to improve efficiency by 20%. It really goes to show that it's not easy. Nonetheless, yeah. So I wanted to compare, say, what the high capacity A321 CO variant compared with the A321neo, the newer version, what it meant for each airplane on a specific sample flight that I derived using statistics that the Department of Transportation publishes on a quarterly basis. And then I formed a profitability model where I look at what revenue they're producing and then subtracting every single line item cost that they have, including in the carbon tax scenarios, the carbon tax, and not just the carbon tax, but the lost demand from the higher ticket price. When I did my comparisons, it wasn't just on a plane-to-plane -plane basis, it was also on an airline business model basis. I'm sure you and the listeners here will know that Spirit and United are very different airlines, right? Like Spirit is a low-cost carrier. They nickel and dime you everywhere. But the idea is that they're supposed to be the cheapest fare on the market. United is considered a full-service or legacy carrier where they cater to the masses, not just the price-sensitive consumer, but also to business travelers, to international travelers. Basically, the two airlines try to cater to different markets. There is still a lot of overlap, but fundamentally, I wanted to see, well, how does that factor into their fleet renewal decision? And there were some interesting implications from my research there as well. Broadly speaking, because LCCs cater to leisure travelers or price-sensitive travelers, an increase in price is going to be highly detrimental to them versus a United where maybe a good mix of their audience or customer base is business travel. LCCs really were hurt terribly in my model by the carbon tax because it shot up the price so much that consumers and their target audience just would not choose to fly them. In terms of the incentive to operate older airplanes, low-cost carriers have much less incentive to operate these older planes that are less fuel efficient because ultimately it just significantly impacts their top-line revenue. Oh, that's so interesting. So we're kind of faced with this need of updating yes. the, the, the plane models, but mm -hmm. then we're also faced with this other issue of if we update the plane models for the LCCs, people won't want to fly with them anymore because the price would be too expensive. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it, it is one issue that I like brought up at the end of my thesis of if we lose low cost carriers in the market entirely structurally, that will have major implications for like the kinds of prices that consumers pay. LCCs place a downward price pressure 
on ticket prices. That makes travel accessible to the masses. So that's one thing, right? Like I mentioned that LCC is primarily catered to leisure travelers. Now, ultimately, I think what we see going on right now is that LCCs are managing to stay alive even though they're operating older planes. One thing to note here is that procuring new airplanes is both really easy and really difficult today. It's easy because in the past you had to buy the planes, but now you can lease them. But on the other hand, both Boeing and Airbus, which are the two major airplane manufacturers in the world, are not able to keep up to pace with their delivery schedules. They are not delivering planes at a fast enough rate to satisfy the demand in the market. There's an airline in India called Indigo, and they are a low-cost carrier. They have 60% market share. They're doing amazing. They ordered something like 600 airplanes last year, all Airbus A320s. They're not getting those planes until 2035. Whoa. So yeah, exactly. Those deliveries run through till 2035. One other thing I should mention, and this is really important with the aviation industry, and I don't think a lot of people realize it, is that sustainability and profitability are 100% intertwined and they are not separable whatsoever because one of the airline's primary cost drivers is fuel. It means that they want to buy the most fuel efficient planes possible so that they can reduce their costs. It's not like airlines don't have an incentive to decarbonize either. It all falls down to the fact that airlines want this as bad as climate activists, for instance, do, but airlines don't exactly, airlines aren't designing airplanes, right? So... Your thesis sounds very technical. It seems I, the regular person would not be able to understand half of those concepts, yeah. I think. But it seems like it affects everybody and it's the scope is quite big. I agree. It is very technical. There's a lot of contextual information that goes into my thesis. It made my thesis writing process really difficult, actually, because my intro and background was like 30 pages. Because I was like, you need to know all this information to understand why I made these assumptions, right? And going back through and editing it, it was really difficult to cut down on things because every sentence almost had something that I thought was necessary for the reader to know. But ultimately, most of it was kind of irrelevant. If you didn't understand it, I had to really cut down on it, at least in terms of the actual analysis I did. Not so technical. Really, anyone could understand seeing like, okay, revenue, you make this much. Fuel costs this much. You have to pay this much for your pilots and flight attendants. These are your overhead fees to park at the gate at the airport. That was actually kind of a bulk of my analysis. So ultimately, I'm so proud you know, of what I managed to do. And I think that there is real implications for my work. When I started, I had like a real grand aspiration for what I wanted. One thing that I would like recommend for people is to with their thesis is to be both really ambitious with your goals, but also realistic. And by that, I mean, you want to be ambitious enough where there is like a fire under you. You know, you have momentum. You feel like, okay, I actually need to work on this every day and put in consistent effort. Because if you start with an easy goal, you're just going to hold off until the very last moment to do it, right? But that's what I did, right? I started with, well, not an easy goal, but a very, very ambitious goal. And with time, I started to realize like, okay, this isn't working, right? So you have a really ambitious goal. My hope with my goal was, okay, I want to get my data collection or entirely done in my first semester and get started on this serious analysis. Thankfully, I had built in enough of a buffer where I had the whole second semester to Whatever. figure it out. I have a question for you because yeah. it seems like you have this really big interest in, I would say, the environmental sciences. Mm -hmm. And planes at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So why did you choose econ as your major? When I was 10 years old in the fifth grade, I realized I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I want to do that. I want to start my own business. So I actually spent middle school not doing any homework, just writing business plans legitimately. Like that's all I did. What it ended up meaning was that I started to form this rudimentary perhaps at the time, but now like I think it's so invaluable. Understanding of how to analyze a business, a business model. I, I did some more formal stuff relating to entrepreneurship in high school. And then in 2020, right after I graduated, I started a business. From the get-go, I understood that, hey, if I want to really understand the way businesses work, I need to understand the way markets work. And that's what economics gives me. The whole environmental sciences thing and sustainability, it's all very important, but none of this will ever happen without the financial markets working towards supporting that as well. Not just the financial markets, but even just on a business to business, individual to individual level. We study all of that. I think even if I want to make an impact environmentally, which I do, you know, that's something that I am passionate about. I think it's important to have a foundational, solid understanding of economics, the way businesses operate in markets, the way financial markets operate, and also the way that you and I consume products as consumers.
I chose Reed for a couple reasons. One of them being that it was mysterious. You know, I, I I don't know how you felt when you were researching Reed, but I didn't I didn't like uh, tour or anything, and I. The only information I could go by was what was online. I applied to 15 schools and the 14 others had a breadth of information online. You could find anything. You could go on YouTube and find a day in the life of a person there. There was none of that for Reed. And somehow that was interesting to me. I don't know. And also actually going back way further and back to this entrepreneurship thing. When I was in the fourth grade, I read the Steve Jobs biography. Reed was mentioned there, right? Because he, he he was here briefly. It wasn't actually mentioned in the most positive light in that book, but the name stuck. And Steve Jobs, from a young age, had been like a big inspiration for me, especially with this whole entrepreneurship thing. I, I valued the way that he, especially as a marketing man, the way that he presented Apple. I have friends today that I know are going to be a Nobel Prize laureate you know, 20 years down the future or whatever, whatever their aspirations may be and make a big impact on the world. And I want to be want to be one of those people that I think was really what attracted to me to read a lot. These might be slightly controversial words for some people in uh, California, but I think Reed is the best liberal arts college on the West Coast. I'm really happy I went here. You know, I mean, it's like Ph.D. prep school. What was the outcome of your thesis? Yeah, long story short, what we see is that the current tax rate that the EU has for their emissions trading system, I say current, by that I mean that the price as of October 2023, which was actually a long time ago, but was current when I started my thesis. If we were to implement that carbon tax directly, it would disincentivize airlines from flying most older airplanes. So, for instance, low-cost carriers would not be profitable at all if they flew the A320 or A321CO. So my model assumed that without carbon taxes, airlines were looking at about a 16 to 20-something percent margin per flight. But with the carbon taxes, the margins either went negative or they went down to like 2%. So I think what that means on a policy sense is that politicians and policymakers could consider using a carbon tax as a means of incentivizing or more efficient flight. And on the other hand, for airlines, there's also implications for this. For low-cost carriers, this means that if they want to be prepared for the future, they need to procure as many new airplanes as they can. As I mentioned earlier, uh, that's kind of impossible right now because of supply constraint on uh, the airframe side. Even if they wanted to, they can't. On the other hand, for legacy or full service carriers, because they can continue to operate some plane, some older planes profitably, the incentive is less clear. You just recently graduated and you were talking about the future just now. And I was curious to know, you know what plans do you have now that you've graduated? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to be moving to Seattle. I got a job not in aerospace, which is surprising. Some people, uh, you might know, uh, Seattle is the home to Boeing. And uh, it's a dream for me. I'd love to go work there one day. I'm actually going to be getting into the finance world, joining a company called Morgan Stanley. They have an offshoot in Seattle called Parametric. They do quantitative algorithmic trading. Very different from this passion of mine, but it's going to be a great starting experience for me to see what the world of finance is like, to develop some real solid quant skills as well. Long term, I want to work in aviation. My mind is set on it. That's my North Star. There's like nothing else that I really see myself doing. So I'm going to start at Morgan Stanley and I'm I'm going to learn a lot. I'm going to have a great time, build up some professional experience that, that I'm going to use to leverage to hopefully be the leader of an aerospace company one day. Any advice you want to give to incoming Reedies or people just starting their thesis? Well, with Reed, I would say it's way too easy to get stressed out about it and try and do everything. And one thing I was really intentional with when I got to read was to not stress out about things. So I I remember I was taking this math class and I came to read wanting to be a quant econ major. That changed after this one math class I took where I spent like six hours working on the exam and turn it in feeling okay, like not not like, oh, I got 100%, but like, okay, like I, 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 I eked by, like I was able to answer the questions. Two days later, I, I get my test back and it was like 25%. I got a 25% on it. I'm sitting in that class, it's on Zoom in my freshman year and I'm trying to hold back tears. I'm like almost crying. After the class ended, I told myself, I'm never ever gonna take a class th that makes me wanna cry ever. 
again. And I dropped the class that day. I have no regrets about it whatsoever. Don't get caught up in the stress, especially professors. The professors who read are so great because they take their work so seriously, but it's a double-edged sword because then they'll give you a ton of work and they'll give you their grad school problem set and expect you to solve it. But we're like 18 and 19 or whatever, you know, we're young, just out of high school. So take it easy. Like don't care about grades and stuff. Just try and learn. Pass your classes for sure. That's great. What's more important than getting the good grade is to feel like you've learned something and also setting boundaries of like, I'm not going to work until 2 a.m., you know, just to finish the reading. And my last question, is there anybody you want to thank, any shout out you want to make, anybody you want to acknowledge? Yeah, definitely. Um, I want to start with Erin Hunt, my thesis advisor. This was not at all her area of expertise, but Erin was just so great at helping me through the, the whole process and kind of giving me good guiding advice. And it was good to have someone to check in with that you knew was like a, a friend, like a supporter. Thank you, Aaron, for, for all the help, for guiding me through this whole thing, navigating the Institutional Review Board and trying to, because I, I did some interviews in my thesis and you know, getting that license. And, and then I'd love to thank Layla, my girlfriend. I love you. She's amazing. She is my rock. And then I would love to thank a bunch of people at Pratt & Whitney. I'll just name some names, but I won't go into too much detail. Larry Gray, Charles Inyang, Brian Rivard, Michelle Reich, and Neri Cruz in particular. All of you, thank you so much for your expertise, your time. Last but not least, uh, I'd like to thank Vinay Dubé the CEO of Acasa Air for his crazy wisdom and time. And I couldn't have done any of this without all of those people. Thank you, Rune, for getting on the podcast and for letting me interview you. Yeah, this was such an honor. I, I Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so glad to have been here. Arun, thank you so much for all your wonderful insights and thank you for your advice and your fun anecdotes. I will agree with you and say that a lot of people that are currently at Reed have a very bright future ahead of them. You included. I hope you'll join us again to hear more from students and alumni about what it means to burn your draft. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe, check out our X, Facebook, and Instagram pages, and write a review on Apple Podcasts. Burn Your Draft is a production of Reed College and the Center for Life Beyond Reed, created jointly by students, alumni, and staff. This episode was produced and engineered by me, Reed College student, Avis Gorea. Our executive producer is Seth Paskin, class of 1990, with technical advising from Joe Janiga. Our project manager is Nate Martin, staff member and class of 2016. Music by Jack Silvucci, class of 2020, and podcast art by alumni Henry Goshley and Lillian Pham. This podcast was made possible by a gift from Seth Paskin.